on uh, material that I that I started looking at with uh, with my book um, Pieces of Mind, uh, which I also presented when it was a work in progress uh, here in Edinburgh. Um, and actually, you know, given the three uh, uh, you know, parts of the series that, uh, that, that Mark just mentioned. This is, this is actually kind of more meta cognition, thinking about thinking. Um, so let me just, let me just kind of say what's, what's, oh, how do I move? Huh. Uh, how do I, I can't, I can't seem to change my screen. Do you mean how do you go through your presentation? Yeah. It should be the same as you always do. Maybe the, just the arrow over arrow. Oh, here it is. It's at the bottom. Okay. There we are. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So let me just, you know, kind of explain that what the title is all about, right? Um, so, and stop talking about like cognition as a, you know, sort of whole thing. Um, we could talk about cognitive capacities and in particular human cognitive capacities. So, um, this is just to kind of give you an overview of, of what I'm thinking about. Um, so what are they, right? What are cognitive, what, what do we mean when we're talking about that? Well, there's one way of thinking about it, which I'll just call definition one, where you're talking about the cognitive capacities of human beings, right? And that's a species specific case, because um, I'm looking at this from a comparative um, perspective. But there's another way of thinking about it, which is where you're just kind of talking about cognitive capacities generally, and you're thinking more about the human capacity as, as being criteria for the rest, right? So that's, you know, like the human capacity is what it is to have that particular capacity. So if you're talking about, you know, language, you know, you're take, thinking human language, and that's just what language is. And anything that sort of differs in ways that may or may not be specified isn't language, right? And you can do the same thing about episodic memory, rational inference, you know, teaching, what is teaching? Is it human pedagogy? Is it something else? Culture, what's culture? So all of these sort of broadly psychological and, you know, social psychological and, and other types of psychological um, concepts can be thought of in these two different ways. And, um, uh, that's it's it's kind of prob it's problematic. Um, that's that's what I kind of want to want to say. So, for example, and this is just one of many, uh, a bit of a very ongoing discussion in the um, comparative literature. Um, so, the whole issue comes up about the difference between these two ways of thinking about cognition. Uh, within the context of comparing humans and non-humans. And the whole debate about continuity and discontinuity stems from Darwin's claim way back when that, um, you know, the human mind was continuous with, you know, with animal minds, right? Um, and that has been a controversial kind of thing ever since. Um, and so there's been a lot of research recently about what is, you know, various uh, non-human species being able to do various, you know, things that we would normally think of as being uniquely human. Uh, how do you compare these two things? And so there's this debate, the, the people who are more for, you know, it's just continuous, it's just a difference in degree. And then the people who are defending a more discontinuous view, you know, that it's, it's a difference in kind, right? And so David Premack, who was, you know, a, a you know, very important figure in terms of you know, the chimp theory of mind way back, um, but ever since, you know, he's, uh, he is on the discontinue, this discontinuous side of this. But in any case, he asks a question in this recent article, you know, where he, where he goes on to elaborate where he thinks the difference in kind lies. And he says, it is essential when claiming human-like capacities in animals to ask this question, is the animal faculty equivalent to that of the human? Now, there's, there's a, there, this question can be asked in two different ways that roughly correspond to the two different definitions that I gave. I mean, again, you know, interpreting him charitably, uh, you know, one can say, first of all, well, he's just saying, you know, you've got a capacity that humans have and that animals have, and are we just, you know, comparing these two different capacities, these capacities that are the same in some way, and are they like, you know, are they equivalent? 
Um, but there's another way, of course, to interpret it, where you're taking the human capacity as the criterion, and you're saying, well, the animal capacities are like ours in some ways. Are they equivalent? And in, in this particular case, what you're doing is you're putting the human capacity as, as the sort of the criterion, and then the animal capacities are, you know, similar to that to some degree. And Similarity, the way to see this is similarity, of course, is a symmetric relation, but the asymmetry, the, the symmetry gets broken when one of the relata, namely the human capacity, is the criterion for the other, right? And that's why we, that's why he says, or on this interpretation, if you're talking about a human-like capacity in an animal, you, you can't all, also say, well, a human-like capacity in an animal is an is a animal-like capacity in a human, right? That's the symmetric way to think about it. But of course, that's not really what, uh, what he's saying on this particular interpretation. So the question can be interpreted in both of these different ways. And so what I'm interested in talking about and what I'm interested in teasing out are this, this second definition here, this idea that human capacities are criterial for everything else, how do we tease these two definitions apart and why should we, right? And what sort of implications um, does this have? So first I'm gonna say, you know, what does it mean for, for human condition to be criterial, right? And I call this kind of anthropocentric psychology. It could be uh, an anthropocentric uh, cognitive ethology. It could be anthropocentric comparative evolutionary psychology. Basically just thinking about psychological uh, you know, concepts and the whole of actually the science of psychology from a, an anthropo anthropocentric perspective. And there's various ways in which that's done. I'll go through them a bit. Um, why is this a bad thing? Uh, you know, basically, I would just say, you know, for one thing, it's inconsistent with the theory of evolution. You know, you, you can do one or the other, or you can be a dualist, uh, but you can't have both and be a naturalist. Um, and the second thing is it's actually, it, it impedes our scientific investigation and understanding of what cognition is. Okay, and then I will, you know, the alternative that I'm, uh, that I advocate, I call, I'm calling species neutral psychology. Um, and I will say very briefly about its, its implications uh, for the relationship between the, the scientific psychology and then our folk or mentalistic vocabulary. Okay, so I'm gonna do this fairly quickly because I, I'm not, I don't wanna, uh, you know, uh, I wanna spend more time on the conceptual aspect, but um, basically the methodological aspect of anthropocentrism, and this is the one that people in the sciences, you know, tend to focus on. Um, and this is where humans and their cognitive capacities shape the way empirical research proceeds, right? So your research agenda, the questions you ask, the way you design your experiments, um, everything is sort of from this perspective. And uh, Sarah Shettleworth is a major figure in comparative psychology. You know, she calls this the anthropocentric approach. Other people have different labels for the same thing. So this is not, you know, particularly new to me, uh, but it's worthwhile sort of putting within the umbrella of anthropocentrism. And the key question here usually is something like, you know, can the species do what we do? Right, and you can kind of see this, the, the idea that, well, what we do is, is the real thing, it's the full-blooded version, and how close do they get to us, right? So can they count? Thinking about counting is what we do, right? In some intuitive way, right? They found out that this is not exactly what we do. Uh, can they remember past personal episodes, you know, episodic memory? Can they attribute mental states to others? Can they recognize themselves and so forth? So you ask these sorts of questions, can they do what we do? Um, and then you, your research designs kind of follow from that way of framing your research, right? So do they pass the mirror test for self-recognition, right? Uh, do they understand, you know, human mental states, right? Because they're the experiment, you know, has the chimps, you know, trying to figure out or allegedly trying to figure out what a human being is thinking as opposed to, say, another chimp, right, and so forth. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the ways in which, and there's, you know, a zillion, there's lots more behind that. The epistemological anthropocentrism is this idea that, that humans and our capacity, uh, our, our behavior, our bodies, right, um, uh, that 
we are the evidential standard, right? You know, so sufficient similarity to us is what you need for some ascription to be prima facie justified, right? Um, and so, for example, some people will require verbal evidence, verbal behavior as evidence, right? Other people, of course, you know, object, well, then that just puts the animals at a extreme disadvantage to say the least. But in any case, you do see people saying that sort of a thing. Various forms of confirmation bias. So Morgan's canon, which says you should basically go for a, uh, you know, a less complex uh, explanation over a more complex one. I mean, there's a lot of debate about that. But the anthropocentric idea of it is just that it gets, we interpret what animals do more in terms of, you know, associationist sorts of explanations. There's always an associationist explanation possible. We don't apply that similarly to, uh, to human beings, right? Uh, we also don't look for, for any, for, for particular capacities where we don't think they're going to happen, right? Um, so that will bias the, uh, the, the record, right? So that's just a general form of confirmation bias. Um, there's also ethical limits on what we can do with human beings, right? So we can't clone people, right? We can't just, we can't have the genetic controls and we can't have the, um, the environmental controls, you know, current environment or, well, current environment to some extent, but past experience, we can't control these for humans. So this is going to give the, give a sort of a more of an impetus to explaining human behavior in more cognitive terms. Whereas with the animals, we've got more information about their past experience and their genetic makeup. We can, we can design things that way. Um, so we're going to have more of that information available. And so the result is basically that, you know, both for unavoidable reasons like ethical limits and reasons that we might be able to uh, alleviate, the comparative research record is going to be biased in certain ways. The one I'm really interested in today is the conceptual uh, aspect. Um, and this is the idea that I had in definition two, where human capacities define what the capacities are, right? And I'll just say, you know, so you can talk about the extensions of co cognitive concepts, you can talk about cognitive constructs, you can talk about the predicates, you know, those are different things, but for current purposes, I'll just kind of put that all under the umbrella of conceptual um, anthropocentrism. And this leads to, as I mentioned when I started, this ambiguity between what we mean when we talk about human cognitive capacities. Are we just talking about like the human species specific capacity? Or are we talking about cognitive capacities in general where the humans are kind of the criterial species and then everything else is related to us? Um, so that's one issue which I'm going to get back to. Um, a second is that there's another debate that kind of goes alongside is a, what I call, think of as a kind of genetic fallacy where, uh, where people argue, well, you know, we introduced all these cognitive, you know, mentalistic vocabulary for referring to our, uh, our capacities, and that's just what they refer to. And so when we talk about you know, thinking in an animal or, you know, episodic memory or whatever, it's either, you know, anthropomorphic, as Kennedy argues in his book, The New Anthropomorphism, or it's just nonsense, as Bennett and Hacker argue, you know, so there's this sort of essential tie between the vocabulary and the human capacity specifically, um, which ignores the fact that we introduce vocabularies all the time with, you know, in terms of referring to specific aspects of, of the world phenomena. Uh, and then they change, right? I mean, we find out more, we find out, you know, we weren't quite right. Our referential intentions, we tried to get at it, and you know, it has to be revised, right? So we've done this a lot throughout the history of science. It's, I've argued elsewhere that this is what's happening in, in psychology. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of what's the various forms of anthropocentrism, um, why is it a bad thing, right? Well, two basic reasons here. If you are a naturalist about the mind, uh, it's scientifically indefensible, right? And that's just, you know, I'll, I'll argue for both of these, right? 
Um, second of all, if you want to, if we do want to understand empirically, right, what it is that makes a, mo a human mind unique, right, continuous or discontinuous, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, you have to jettison the anthropocentrism and you have to go for some sort of species neutrality, right? It's, it's not something that's optional. Okay, so this is, you've probably seen this, the Scala Nature, uh, which, um, you know, I, I don't know if I can indicate here, it's God at the top and the angels, um, you know, man comes in right over about there, you know, then you get various beasts, the plants, flames, rocks, right, everything, everything was in the Scala Nature, right, and so it was, you know, and this is from Lovejoy's book on this. Um, it was an ontologically full hierarchy of being um, ordered by degrees of perfection. So it was a hierarchy. It started with God at the top, the from which all being emanated, and everything else was a less perfect version of God, right? You know, there was grades of perfection. Every single, you know, possible degree was occupied by some, uh, some entity, right? L living and not living. Um, let me, where did I go here? Okay. Um, so he was, the, he was the criterion of perfection. Humans were less perfect, so on and so forth, right? So it's a very clear, ve uh, you know, very influential way of thinking about uh, not just perfection, but of course human beings and our relationship to the rest of the animal uh, kingdom, right? Um, and notice you can kind of have the same sort of ambiguity, you could, you didn't have it actually, but uh, if you wanted to know, like, what is you know perfection? What's this thing by which we're arranging all the all the all the things that exist? Um, you might say, well, what's perfect perfection versus divine perfection, right? And uh, but in the Scala Nature, divine perfection just defined what perfection was. I mean, he that he defined what being is, right? So you couldn't you couldn't take them apart. Right, um, and so there's this sense in which you uh, you you didn't have two you couldn't have two definitions. You could only have the, the what I called the definition two, where God is the criterion for everything else, and everything else is a lesser degree of what He actually uh, defines, which is perfection. Right? So this way of thinking about you know about nature, uh, about you know everything in the world. Um, contradicts evolution in, to, in very clear ways. Um, and I'm just focusing on the ways that really matter for anthropocentrism and psychology. Um, uh, one is that phylogeny doesn't yield a hierarchy, right? There's, there's nothing in the history of you know, evolution, however it's happened, that gets you any sort of uh, hierarchical uh, relationship between different, different things, right? Um, and so as a result, no species or any species specific trait is going to be a criterion for any other, right? So this just like rules out the definition two that I put where, you know, human capacities are considered criterial for any other cognitive capacity, right? In other animals, okay? So let me just, you know, just to give you a quote, um, uh, this is from Campbell and Hodos in 1991. Uh, the phylogenetic tree is a genealogy, right, that by itself gives no indication of the relative status of the individuals listed with respect to any gradational arrangement. Okay, so that's basically what I'm, what I'm um, um, saying there. Um, now what's happened, and this has been found in psychology and biology, um, and, in, and um, is a persistence of thinking about nature even in, among biologists and certainly among psychologists in a kind of a ladder-like way. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not the, the only person to, to be saying that. I mean, you can kind of see it everywhere and other people have argued that in psychology, right? Um, so, but what happens is you get this persistent confusion that infiltrates our cross-species comparisons, right? So you've probably heard, you know, sentences like this, roughly, you know, humans have a more sophisticated, whatever, you know, language, culture, uh, you know, episodic memory. I mean, you name it, you know, we're more sophisticated, right? Um, and this, uh, you know, I'm, this includes people who think there's a difference in degree or people who think there's a difference in kind, 
right? They're, they're both covered by this kind of uh, this, this judgment of, you know, we have a lesser, lesser version. Um, now, there's one way to, to read this, which is consistent with the evolution, with the theory of evolution, which is to say capacities, they rank higher, higher on some scale, you know, on some feature, right? You've got some way to measure that, whatever, than this other species or these other species. And that's perfectly fine, right? I mean, I'm not arguing against human cognitive, you know, you know, impressiveness, um, uh, but you have to do it in a way that's consistent with evolution. The inconsistent way is, again, to sort of think of the human capacities as being defining of the capacity, and then just sort of saying, and the, the non-human ones are, are inferior um, in some way, right? Um, that's the one that we, that, that's the definition too that I mentioned earlier. That one's, you know, it's just ruled out. You cannot think of human capacities as defining what it is to be that capacity. Um, uh, but uh, there's a second aspect of this, right? Is, you know, if you're talking about human capacities as being unique, what is it that makes our minds unique, right? Um, if you think about human capacities, um, uh, in a, as a, in a criterial way, um, you can't really say, I mean, let me, let me, let me back up on that. Because our capacities are human species specific, of course, they are uniquely human, right? That's just like an, uh, you know, pretty much a priori, right? I mean, it's like saying human noses are only human, Right. I mean, it's just it's it's not anything spectacular and it's certainly not an empirical kind of a judgment. Right. That's sort of an a priori thing about, you know, a human nose is defined the way it ever is. And only humans have human noses. Right. By definition. And that's the same. That's that's what I'm saying. So you can't you can make claims about human cognitive uniqueness that are trivial in this way. What you want are capacities that are human, that are unique to humans, but not because it's a priori, but because you have evidence that they are the only, we are the only species that has that capacity. So what you need to do that, which is what, you know, presumably pre-Mac and, you know, a lot of people in comparative psychology are doing, uh, is you, you need species neutral, what I'm calling species neutral concepts in order to make claims about our uniqueness, right? Um, so if you're, if you're, say, a continuity theorist, you think, you know, it's just a difference in degree, it's not a difference in kind, you know, that's fine. Then you, what you're saying is something like, well, we've got the same trait and it's found across these species in each in their own species specific variation. And we're high, we can hierarchically order that by some factor, right, or other, you know, maybe there's, uh, you know, more domains that we can access than some other species. So you're doing an ordering by number of domains or something like that. Um, so that's fine. So you got the same trait has to be defined in a way that different species can have it in their own species specific variation. If you're a discontinuity theorist, then you're saying, then you have to be able to say, well, the same trait might have been found in other species, but it isn't, right? It's just found in humans. And that makes it a, an a posteriori uniqueness claim where only we have this, right? But our version is still species specific, right? Uh, you're still using a, def a definition of the trait that's species neutral. Then you're just saying, you know, this, this capacity is found only in us. Of course, it's in our variation because that's inevitable right? Uh, but you're still defining the trait across species. So to give you a quick non-cognitive example, um, menopause, right? Many, it used to be, and this is actually from Thomas Suddendorf, um, we used to think that menopause was just a human trait, right? It was only found in human beings. Uh, I should say, you know, menopause is defined, I mean, there's various definitions, but basically it's reproductive senescence, um, you know, the cessation of, of ovulation before, before death, right? And 
Um, and so the, the, it was originally thought this is just something that humans have. Um, but it turns out that, you know, a few primates also, uh, but also killer whales, which is kind of interesting. Um, so humans and killer whales, you know, inter few alia, um, also have undergo menopause, right? So you started out with a particular trait, menopause. It's defined in a way that that trait might have been found in a different species. Um, it might not have been, and in which case the claim that it's, it's uniquely human would have been true a posteriori, right? It turns out that that was not true. And so it's, it's just false for a posterior reasons, right? We found out that killer whales also have it. So let me just give you a quick cognitive example. Uh, how am I doing time? I, my, I got, okay. Um, so let me just go through some of the, uh, the, very briefly again, there's a voluminous literature in episodic memory. Um, you know, this is not like settled, this is settled science. I mean, it's still very much in the, in the, um, both theoretically and empirically, you know, under construction, so to speak. Um, so Tolving, 1972, he initially distinguished it from semantic memory, you know, memory of facts, roughly speaking, as, you know, what, where, when memory. So memory of what happened when and where, right? Um, and then, and, and his, you know, he did this based on human subjects research and, and think about them. Um, and then you have 92, um, uh, looking at um, crows, right, um, or corvids more generally, uh, eventually, uh, where they found that these are food caching birds. They're the sort of animal that you might think would want to, you know, it's, it's their lifestyle to bury food for future use. Right. So it's the species that you might think of, given the, the way they live, uh, that would be benef it would be very beneficial for them to have this type of memory. And so they found you know, evidence that they were, that they, they do have episodic memory. Okay, fast forward to 2005, lots of discussion, empirical stuff back and forth. And Tolving says, well, you know, actually... You know, you also need autonomic consciousness or mental time travel. Um, and this is the idea that you somehow re-experience the episode, right? You know, you somehow imagine yourself there. And, and this, in human beings, this is usually given by verbal report. Oh, yeah, I remember, you know, sitting in that chair, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And he also claims that only humans have episodic memory. Um, uh, it's an a posteriori claim. Right, he's not saying that you know I'm supporting this myth of the skull and the tour or anything like that. He's proposing, he's saying you know yes, you need autonomic consciousness, and I think only human beings have that. Therefore, episodic memory is restricted, is unique to humans. More recently, you know Clayton and Russell um, have offered a species neutral, you know, what they call minimalist, but it's only minimalist if you're thinking of the human variety as criterial, right? Um, the species neutral definition of re-experiencing, and they're kind of inspired by Kant here. I mean, the details don't really matter. Um, there's, there's a, you, you have to have a particular perspective on the facts that you know. Um, they say it's non-conceptual, so it doesn't have to have a background of self-awareness and networks of conceptual abilities, just like, like in our case, right? Um, and so what they say is, you know, episodic, they agree, right? Yeah, you need to have mental time travel. You need to have this re-experiencing element, right? So they're, they're not denying that, as some people do, right? So they say episodic memory involves an organism re-experience in an early situation. So they agree with Tolding, this is a condition, right? But just as human episodic memory will inherit what is present in human experience, avian episodic memory will inherit the character of avian experience, right? So the, basically what they're trying to do is exactly the sort of thing that, uh, that they should be doing is trying to find ways to think. You start thinking about a particular capacity from our perspective, I mean, you have to start somewhere, right? But then you sort of, you, you try to find a way to think about it in a way that doesn't make the human 
species specific capacity criteria across species, right? Because that is ruled out by evolution. You cannot do that, right? You can compare them, but you can't do it that way. So just to wrap that up with, you know, I started with, you know, cognition, human cognition. Um, so just take the specific case of, you know, what is human episodic memory? Well, by the first definition, it's the episodic memory of humans, right? It's our species specific variety of a particular trait. The second definition, of course, it says, you know, it's episodic memory where you're taking our type as criterial for the rest. And so the rest don't really have it if they don't have the re-experiencing, you know, and so forth. If they don't have the concepts, the self-awareness, all the rest of the stuff that we have, that is not real episodic memory. Okay, so as we know, the second way of thinking about it is not permitted if you're gonna be a naturalist, if you're going to say, I want a theory that is consistent with evolution, right? No species specific capacity can be criteria for any other. Um, and you can say, well, you know, of course it's unique to us, you know, by, you know, human, human episodic memory, of course, is human, right? I mean, nothing else can have a human episodic memory except human. But now, we've got is a concept that allow a posteriori matter unique to humans or if there are in fact other creatures that have it. Um, so, you know, just to, I'm almost finished at this point. Um, so for, oh, for an over, overall type of species neutral psychology, right, to replace the anthropocentric one, um, you need you know, various even-handed methodologies, right? And, and you can see this, These, the, there's a lot of uh, you know, debate and uh, you know, changing within the comparative literature uh, where people have you know, stopped asking the question, can they do what we do, right? That is not the question that people ask anymore, right? Uh, at least not, it just doesn't drive all the research, right? It's, it's you think about the other, the non-humans as, you know, themselves and what do they do and what capacities would be useful for them in their usual sort of environment, right? If, you know, what they've adapted, uh, what, what would be good for them to have? And that's the sort of the thinking with the, with the crows and the episodic memory. There's also treating other, treating humans as just another animal species, which is what we are. I mean, we have this really weird inclusive sense, which puts them apart from us. I toggle back and forth from that in a very unsystematic way. But, you know, one of the ways in which this thing is that, you know, you, you test, say, chimps and preverbal pre children in the same subject pool with the same stimuli. Right. You think about what you've, you know, the way you're testing humans, say, say you're testing non-humans with stimuli that to them are, is nonsense. It's, it's just, it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't have any meaning. Well, retest the humans in those conditions too with stimuli that don't have any meaning, right? So forth. Um, more awareness of our epistemic biases. Um, you know, there probably should not be a verbal report requirement, but of course, how to replace that. And, you know, just being aware of a lot of these asymmetries here. Um, and then you need your species neutral conceptual schemes um, because you cannot build the hierarchy into the phylogeny, right? Um, and you want empirically discoverable uniqueness. You do not want claims of a priori uniqueness. Okay, so last slide here. Um, one you know, major implication is, you know, how will this, you know, developing psychology, you know, psychology be related to folk, you know, folk psychology as understood as a, uh, you know, mentalistic vocabulary or vernacular vocabulary. Um, I think it's gonna, it'll be interesting, but I think it's gonna be, they're gonna coexist. I mean, this is what I eventually hope to argue. Um, and it won't be comfortable at first, but I think we've seen pattern, there are patterns like this throughout science, right? So our folk vocabulary has lots of social and moral uses, right? We, you know, dehumanization, we use cognitive capacities to, you know, to get to, to, 
to deprive certain human beings of certain rights. Um, uh, and conversely, we will not, uh, you know, as ascribe uh, mental states to animals because we're going to eat them. Right. I mean, so there's various uses here that have very important social and moral um, uh, that are that are socially and, and morally important. Scientific vocabulary, of course, is, you know, that's we're trying to get truth or empirical adequacy or, you know, whatever your favorite epistemic you know, situation is. Um, and those are just two different, you know, roles for vocabulary. And so I think what's going to, what this is my own prediction, is you're going to have a situation where you've got the scientific vocabulary um, and the folk are going to keep kind of using psychological vocabulary. And it's sort of like, you know, you, you, you can use yours over there. We're going to use ours over here, kind of stay in your lane. Uh, and this is kind of what we do with other vocabulary. So I'm thinking, you know, gold is a good example here. Not every, not every element of the, of the periodic table, but gold has been, that term and the, the material has been part of human life for a really long time. And it has played an, an enormous social role, right? I mean, just the, you know, the, wealth, right? You know, gold, the gold standard and, and gold medals. And, uh, you know, so I mean, uh, you know, gold, you know, oh, you know, he's golden, right? I mean, we, we use the term gold in all kinds of loose ways, but they're used in particular contexts for, you know, to, to show praise, right? To show value. Um, and these are all kind of social moral purposes for the term gold. And then there's this other vocabulary, which is just the atomic number 79, right? Do we confuse these things? No, right? We know, you know, they kind of stay in their own lane. We talk about a golden statue. It's not really gold. You know, it's just gold plated or gold colored or something like that. We know we're not talking about the atomic number 79. Right. And if somebody pressed you and said, oh, well, that that barrette in your hair, is that gold? You know, it's just gold. You say, well, it's not real gold. It's not I'm not I'm not trying to be, you know, to talk, you know, to, to speak truthfully about the color of my barrette. I'm I'm just saying, you know, it's gold, it's gold colored and, and we're much looser. And but we recognize when we want to talk about the world the scientific vocabulary takes precedence. And when we want to use it in all these other social uses, you know, then we, we can still have our vocabulary while still keeping, you know, remembering, you know, it's not real gold. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get any money out of this barrette or something like that. Okay, so that is, um, that's pretty much it. Um, this is a wonderful view from Braid Hills. Um, so anyway. Thank you for uh, for listening. Thank you.